Greetings, friends. In this video, I'm going to discuss the questions such as, will Russia and the United States be in World War III? Why is Russia fighting? Why have they been fighting? Are they really just so evil that they just wanted to conquer? Why is neocon America fighting them? Why is NATO opposing them? And why did Putin wait so long to institute these referendums and call for a mo uh, partial mobilization of 300,000 reservists? Did the Russians suffer a big defeat in Kharkiv? Perhaps they did. Are Russians demoralized on the whole? Is the Russian public westernized and feeling the pinch economically and, and you know, psychologically that they cannot continue supporting this terrible war? Who is winning the economic war? Is the West winning? Is Russia winning? Why are we in a dangerous moment right now? Well, I alluded to that with, you know, the United States and Russia getting into perhaps a direct conflict rather than through a proxy. And why is the global American empire worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? These are the sorts of questions I'll be dealing with in this video. But if you don't want to listen to the whole thing, the main takeaway is that if these referendums bring these eastern provinces, which are occupied by the Russians, into the Russian Federation, so that they become part of the sovereignty of Russia. That changes the whole nature of the war, because now the attacks on these regions and these peoples will now be an attack on the mother country of Russia. And that will enable the military to expand its aims, to expand the number of soldiers they're using, and also change the stated military uh, objective. It will no longer be a special military operation, in, if that happens, if they become part of Russia, it, and, the, and the fighting continues. This will now expand the uh, capacity of Russia to bring in more soldiers and also to change the strategy where they can target command centers, they can target civilian infrastructure. I know that's happened to, to an extent already, to an extent, but theoretically they could go all out. So this is really a dangerous moment we're in. A dangerous moment, not so much because Russia wants to conquer part of the Ukraine, as tragic as war is, but dangerous particularly because the West, or at least the leaders of the West, do not seem to be capable of anything at this time other than escalating. I don't normally comment on geopolitical affairs in the news, but this war in the Ukraine between Russia and NATO, essentially, as a proxy using the Ukrainians, this war is significant enough and the developments recently are dangerous enough that I felt like talking about it. When I originally made a video uh, back when this war started, I, I thought the Russians would have uh, conquered most of the country, at least a significant portion by now, and they have, but the war is drawn on like a World War I style conflict. The Russians don't operate like the Americans do in Iraq. That wasn't their strategy to just come in there with overwhelming shock and awe and, and level cities. I mean, it may get to that point now, but that wasn't their initial uh, strategy. Uh, you can mock them calling it a special military operation when it was in fact an invasion. It is an invasion, but there is some truth to calling it a special operation in that they were constrained and have been constrained by uh, certain ob objectives, like try to win over uh, the support of as many Ukrainians as possible, don't, don't try to uh, commit atrocities, which of course the media will be saying the opposite. So it really comes down to what sources do you trust here. I mean, I, mean, I have my sources, you, the, the Ukrainians and the, and the sympathetic liberals and, and the normies will have their sources. So at the end of the day, we can all come up with our facts, but this, so this is all just my opinion here, but I think it's well grounded enough uh, from what I'm, I, you know, I, I, I listen to like the Duran and uh, History Legends, he covers the tactical side of the war, I don't know if he understands too much of the, the long-term strategy here, but you know, I have my sources, so maybe they're wrong, maybe I'm not entirely right, but the question is that they were constrained making it a special operation to de demilitarize the Ukraine, don't let Ukraine become part of NATO, as it was al al already on that road. Don't allow the prospect that there could be long-range missiles in the Ukraine. And secondly, relieve the Donbass provinces, the eastern provinces, majority Russian-speaking peoples who are sympathetic to Russia, allow them to 
be independent or have or, or part of Russia, but but stop these attacks on them by the Ukrainians, uh, which have been going on since 2014, when there was a coup which was supported by the CIA and the United States, which overthrew a Russian sympathetic uh, leader in the Ukraine and replaced it with one that was sympathetic to the West. And at that time, the eastern provinces revolted and said, we're not going to be part of this. And since that time, they've been shelled consistently by the Ukrainians. This has been going on for about eight years now. They've lost like, tens of thousands of people. And what I didn't know when this conflict started was that these militias of these eastern provinces have up to this point in time made, comprised the majority of the fighting force of the, the, the pro-Russian, you know, the Russian, the quote-unquote Russian side. They have made up the at least over 50% of the fighting force, which I think hovers around 200,000 um, combatants. Now that might be, did the Russians send in 200,000 combatants, not including what they got from the militias? I'm a little confused as to that, but I think that generally the fighting side on the Russians was 200,000, but correct me if I'm wrong on that, if that doesn't include the militias. But now things are going to change because they've mobilized uh, 300,000 reservists. This is not a, a draft or conscription. These are people that are already in the reserves and, and they're going to invite other people with former military experiences, men in their 20s to their early 30s. These kinds of like fit men that have military experience are the US and, and Russia going to be in, in World War III soon. And I hope that doesn't happen. No one wants that to happen, but there is some chance of that happening. Now, I'm, I'm not someone who, who analyzes these things, but if it, this is just an opinion video, so I'd say there's like a 15% chance that there will be a direct conflict between NATO and hence the US and Russia and whatever other allies Russia Russia has. And people talk about China getting involved. I don't think that's going to happen right now, but China has its eyes on Taiwan. Russia has its allies in Iran, and they're getting some support from Turkey. Why is Russia fighting this war? Why is NATO fighting this war? Why are they trying to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian? Why do they not care about reaching a diplomatic solution, at least on the, on the West? They have not wanted a diplomatic solution so far. Why are they so intent? And that's a good question, because it seems that the West is a bit insane, or maybe, just, maybe it's just hubris. Maybe they don't know what they really got themselves into. But Russia is fighting for its survival, it is fighting for its mere existence. Not mere, but its, its very existence. It is fighting because the Ukraine is its doorstep. It's its front lawn. It's also the heartland, not just because of the agricultural regions, which are so productive, but just geographically, it's like the heartland of what you could argue the Russian Empire would have been. But even in a geopolitical sense, controlling the Ukraine is, good, is a key region for any empire. And, we, and there have always been empires and there always will be empires. So these, this is just geopolitical facts. You cannot allow Ukraine to become part of NATO. And the fact is that NATO has been poking and expanding against the bear, the Ru Russia, since the Soviet Union collapsed. NATO was originally formed to contain the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapses by the early 90s. NATO does not collapse. NATO sticks around. It gains member states. These member states expand eastward to the protestations of the, of the new Russian Federation to many warnings over the years, especially once the question of Ukraine got involved. But now we see even like the Baltics, like Finland coming into the NATO domain, like Latvia, the Baltic province. Like this is bad. These, these border regions should never have become part of one, they don't, or, or even the Russian, or, or, or even the, the NATO, they, they should remain like as neutral as possible, but NATO is being expansionist. And why? Why would you risk such a global conflagration over the Ukraine? The, the Russians need the Ukraine way more than these Western elites, the global American empire, than they need the Ukraine. Ukraine is useful for them for a variety of uh, shady reasons to do with uh, child sex trafficking, weapons research, like biological, chemical weapons research. There's a variety of reasons they would want to control the Ukraine, but they don't really need it the way that the Russians have to put their foot down, because they've been in this situation in their history numerous times. They have a huge frontier. They cannot easily defend all of their frontier. The Ukraine is a key area with a, with a huge frontier. So.
You could call it genocide of these Russian-speaking peoples in the eastern province. It was the other significant reason for their war. They are being hunted down by what they call neo-Nazis. Now, are they real Nazis? I mean, not exactly. But Ukrainian nationalist uh, militias that don't like Russian, that want them out of the country. That's the impetus for the war here, and that's not what you're going to hear from most media. Why would Russia back down? It can't, and, and I think the majority of the Russian people understand this. Now, recently we've seen the defeat of the, the Russians in Kharkiv region, and they retreated. Maybe it was a real defeat. I'm not saying the Russians haven't suffered defeats in this, in this ongoing, for more, what, seven months now, this war, which has been mostly militias. Uh, so it, it could be that Kharkiv was a, a, a big defeat for them. It probably affected public op opinion, caused more frustration in Russia. But I don't know if it really was strategically such a huge defeat. I don't see that the Ukrainians are continuing to push significantly into more Russian-held territory. I don't see that they could even sustain it because the Russians had already depleted so much of the Ukrainian manpower and they run through so many expenditures which they get from the West on weapons and artillery. They don't really have much of an air force at all. I think it was destroyed early on in the war, unless they're going to get something from the... When I was listening to the Duran and other people, they were pointing out that Russia had already begun to withdraw uh, some of its forces from the Kharkiv region anyways. Re withdraw to borders which would make sense for the referendum, which they now announced, to uh, allow all these territories which have been occupied by them to join the Russian Federation. So the, there would have been a retreat to these more sensible boundaries in the case of there, if there's a diplomatic solution, then these new territories become part of Russia, and just like Bismarck dividing Austria from, from Germany, you know, thinking in, in terms of like ethnic or cultural lines, like how is this going to work, how is this going to be more stable for the future. So maybe I'm wrong, maybe they did suffer a huge defeat in Kharkiv and now it's all just crumbling. Well, okay, I've been waiting for, that, that happened a few weeks now, so Let's see, let's see uh, if, it can, if the Russian lines continue to disintegrate. But even if Russia is losing the war, I, I do think they have the moral justification. They have, they have a, an argument to go to war. And maybe the West can have their own argument to go to war. But it's just sad that they have to use the Ukrainians to almost last men. Why did Putin wait so long to have these referendums? Why did Russia allow this to, to boil on for six or seven months? Now the... The pessimists and the, the Ukrainian, pro-Ukrainian side will, will say, oh, because it's Russia's inefficient, they're stupid, they're losing the war now, so now they're desperate and they're calling up this mobilization. Um, maybe. I don't think that's entirely true because they haven't really been losing the war. They have certainly, with, a, with not numerical superiority, with mostly local militias, they have clearly taken a large chunk of U Ukraine, like a huge... A huge chunk, even given what they just lost recently in Kharkiv, they've, they've, they've taken a huge amount of the territory. They've almost cut off Ukraine from the, the Black Sea. If they go for Odessa in the future, that'll be interesting. If they go for the whole country, right now, I mean, that still seems like kind of far off possibility. But we'll see, because with these referendums, it now allows these regions to become part of Russia. Now, you can be cynical about these referendums. and. To an extent, I am too, but I don't really know because so many people have left these regions as refugees. Like, how would, how would you have like a, an accurate uh, vote if so many of your residents have already left and then there's shelling going on from the Ukrainians to dissuade them? But then some people would say, well, the shelling is, is evidence that the Ukrainians want to disrupt these referendums because you have these referendums and presumably the result is going to be they become part of Russia, these regions in the East. Then we're in a real game changer, and we really are. So we'll have to see in a few days what, what's the result of this. You can be cynical, maybe it's just the state, like, let's just think in terms of real politic here. Even if the result was no in these referendums, or there was just such a low turnout, or it was just like not plausible or technically possible to really have an accurate vote, something that you would, you would recognize as a, as a real vote, do you think Russia's gonna say, oh, well, they voted to, to for the status quo, no, or they, they voted not to become part of Russia. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think if they're having these referendums, it's probably going to be pro-Russian result. 
meaning they become part of Russia. But we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's going to be complications here. But, but there's no way that Russia would just allow that to happen without thinking in advance. And that's just really being practical. I don't even think that's necessarily cynical. I mean, this is really just like empire, you know, statecraft. I mean, this, there's nothing new about this. You can be cynical about this. You can be cynical about war. I mean, oh, you know, war is bad. War is tragic, but we live in a fallen world. Now, the other possibility is that he waited so long to get the Russian people so fed up with this war that they're demanding more, like, let's finish this job. And, and I can see how that might be true. Because if he had just gone all out in the beginning, what do you think the Russian people would have thought? Putin is an autocrat, but he's not exactly like a czar. Like, he does have to take into account public opinion. I mean, so would the czar. The czar would have to take into account public opinion. But I mean, there's more of an onus to think of, how are you going to sell this package? And he, he utilizes similar presentation to Trump in his rallies and the nationalism and the flags. And so there is some skill I would recognize in Putin. Um, certainly Xi Jinping of China, they have these big rallies and there's a certain reason they, they do these things. They do project power, but it, you have to have some mass buy-in from the population. You have to have some mass buy-in. So people are saying, oh, the, uh, the Russians are demoralized. I don't know. In my opinion, that's not what I'm hearing from my sources. My sources, it's like, oh, 70 to 80 percent of Russians support Putin and what he's doing. And they want this war to be concluded, of course, but they're not broken by the sanctions. They're not made to feel guilty somehow that, you know, they're the big bad guys. And I had a friend who said, oh, come on, they must be demoralized because Russia is westernized now. And I mean, yeah, yeah, sure, the tentacles of the West have subverted some things in Russia. But I just don't think it's enough. They just didn't subvert enough yet to be able to demoralize that whole population. Orthodoxy is growing in Russia. Russian nationalism is still strong as far as I can see. Who is winning the economic war? Is the West winning or is Russia winning? I think the answer is clearly the latter. Europe is seeing in many places gas or electricity bills multiplying from the previous year, multiplying by a factor of 10, 11, 12 or more. This is causing even more things to close down than happened during the pandemic or maybe a similar to what happened during the so-called pandemic. Morgoth the nationalist from the north of England talks about how pubs, which date to before Napoleonic times, pubs, country uh, establishments that have been known through the generations, that have survived all these generations, are now closing their doors because they can't pay their energy bills, they could, because they can't pay their electricity bills. When in the past they didn't even have electricity and they managed to survive all these centuries without electricity and now but now they're in the modern age they're tied into the grid you're tied into the system you have to pay into the system you can't pay oh then then you lose everything so but that's i don't mean to get distracted with that so but that ties into the economic war certainly there's inflation in america gas prices uh, it's but it's a lot worse in europe the economic hardship is a lot lot worse because russia has closed these pipelines these gas pipelines uh, europe is relying on on Russia for much of its gas heating, like natural gas, Russia says, oh, well, there's technical reasons we had to close it off, but I mean, come on, like real politic, like you, you shut them off for, for specific reasons. The European elites have not pressed for a diplomatic solution. Some of them, you know, start to like Hungary, maybe Poland, maybe some countries, they, they don't fall in line, but, but France and especially Britain, like Boris Johnson of the UK, who is now no longer the leader, the prime minister, but he was key, key in flying to Ukraine, going to Zelensky and getting them to assure them that more money, more money is coming your way, more weapons are coming your way, don't cede any territory to Russia, this war must continue. And Zelensky cooperated. So really they're killing, they're killing Ukrainians for a proxy war purpose on behalf of NATO, which is dominated by the United States, which, is, which itself is dominated by a select elite who use the United States as the main foundation of their global American empire, G-A-E, or gay, and the, the state religion of this empire is the rainbow flag. We have in some sense here a religious conflict, a conflict of civilizations, one which thinks 
it can conquer the whole earth. And perhaps it may, but I don't know if that time is yet here because of the amazing hubris and stupidity and, and short-sightedness of some of these elites because these aren't people like David Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie who actually started things and were smart. These are now many generations down the line of their children who've just grown up wealthy and grown up going to Ivy League schools and that's the world they know. They don't know history and they don't know that empires fall when there is hubris and they fall for logistical reasons like gas and electricity or power or fuel or, or food, all these things, supply shortages, basic, basic things that they don't even understand why the common person would have a problem uh, putting up with more of this. Well, the common person is not going to put up with this in America and Canada and especially in these European countries. They're not going to put up for very much longer. Or you get a situation where the elites start to fight amongst themselves. I don't know if we're quite there yet, but either there's more mass popular movements or there's real uh, infighting amongst the elites in these Western countries. Uh, one or the other is going to lead to real change and this is going to be coming soon. That's one alternative. That's a positive alternative for us. The negative alternative is that we get into World War III. We'll get to find out how real nuclear weapons are. We'll get to find out. I, I believe nuclear weapons are real. They've I believe they were used in World War II. These things have been tested. But then again, the whole narrative of nuclear weapons, it's just hovering over us and everything's a nuclear. And so, so part of me is skeptical, like what is the full truth? I mean, it's one thing to have a nuclear weapon. Is it, is it actually functioning? Is it, is it, has it been maintained? There's all sorts of things to consider. So whether or not the, the, we could cause a global winter and totally pulverize cities into dust, whether or not, it doesn't matter. World War III would still be ugly, 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 even with lesser weapons. So we are in a dangerous moment, and I sympathize with Russia because, for cultural reasons, I see them taking leadership, you know, being orthodox, that's going to factor into it. Uh, but even for traditional reasons, they're more of a conservative culture. I mean, they are a federation of different peoples, but... They've gone through the Soviet Union, they've survived, they're a, lot, they're a much older civilization than America. They're at least a thousand years old. America today, the global American empire at least, which includes the West and Europe and Australia, New Zealand, but especially America, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. This is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. We are spreading degeneracy around the world through our cultural influence, through financial reasons, the usury system, but even just on a more basic level of spreading the rainbow culture, sacrificing children, pursuing hedonism, lust, pursuing sensual pleasures. And in some of these movies in the 80s, these dystopian movies, the ones, I think Running Man, they're the ones that actually got it closest to the dystopia that ended up happening. Mass crowd suggestion, mass crowd tactics to the point where the, the classical liberals that think everything's going to be fine and we, you know, we can have diversity, we can have everyone just uh, having their, their, their house and their car and in the suburbs and it doesn't matter what the overall culture is, we can have that. But no, now all of a sudden the crowd is sicked on them and there's rage and it can put anyone in line and you, you can't speak and the notion of free speech was always stupid anyways, but now they find out that they don't have what they thought was free speech. Because if it's not backed up by power, then you don't have much right anyways. And that goes along with human rights themselves. This is a conflict of civilizations. No side is perfect. But we do hope that Sodom and Gomorrah will stop uh, oppressing many of their own people who are trapped within its borders. Hasta luego, amigos!